Are you a woman whose life is dedicated to Christian ministry? Do you have a burden to bind up the brokenhearted, set captives free, and lead women to crowns of beauty instead of ashes? Welcome to the Everyday Royalty Podcast, where we dig deeper into strategies that turn the broken into beautiful and make trials your training ground so you can go out as a daughter of the king to lead others into peace and healing. Here's your host, licensed professional clinical counselor and faith and focus coach, Carrie Kitchen. Today's guest is Arlene Pellicane. Arlene is a top marriage and parenting author and speaker. She has appeared on several media outlets like the Today Show, Wall Street Journal, Focus on the Family, Fox and Friends, TLC's Homemade Simple, Family Life Today, and The 700 Club. She's also the host of the Happy Home Podcast and has written for Proverbs 31 Ministries and Girlfriends in God. Arlene shared with me the mission and purpose behind National Marriage Week, as well as where to find tips and resources and creative ideas to help keep a healthy marriage. She shared her wisdom on what makes a healthy marriage so important and so beneficial. Enjoy. Hello and welcome to the show, Arlene. I'm so glad that you're here today. So much fun to be with you, Carrie. Thanks for having me. So I am looking forward to hearing a little bit more about you. As our listeners know, we always start with a testimony and just kind of understanding more about your story and where God has brought you from into this journey and this mission that he's given you now. So please share with us just a little bit about you and your story. Yeah, it's. A, I'm so happy you asked me about this because it goes so well with our topic today. So I was the girl who I think like most girls of the 1980s dreamed of being married. Like I dread, you know, you watch the movies and you're like, oh, I might drop a book and he might pick it up and then we'll meet and then he'll be a Christian and I'll be a Christian and we'll go be missionaries together. Like, you know, I just, I wanted it all. And so very much came into, you know, high school, like, oh, I really want that. But I did not date. It's like, no one asked me out. And then I went to college and no one asked me out. And I'm just like, God, where is this Mr. Wonderful? Like, does this Mr. Right exist? So I was that girl that was like praying, like, Lord, where is he? Where is he? I met someone my senior year of college, really thought that that was the one. He was not the one. Uh, and then I worked for four years, still had not met this man and was just like, Lord, have you forgotten me? <laughs> you know, that kind of thing. And then um, in my late 20s in graduate school is when I met my husband, James, and we're you're married 24 years now. And I, and I can truly say like that, of course, like when you wait for something, and then you get it, it's like very special to you because you realize like, this is not easy. Like, it's not just like, oh, pick this up at the corner. There's like 10 of them. No, it's like, this is very precious. So I think the waiting for being married really set me up to enjoy my marriage, to value marriage. And then also, I don't know, like to be able to commiserate with those <laughs> of you who are out there who are like, where is he? You know, to be able to say, just hang in there, just keep waiting you know, don't settle and just trust God is in the process. Oh, amen. He is. I'm laughing because that sounds so similar. Yes. <laughs> it was yes. not until grad school and all that, like we're around yeah. that time, but yes, it is amazing how we have these expectations and we see it all, all in the movies and on TV and all, all around us. We have these expectations of this storybook relationship and how it's supposed to be and all these Hallmark channel movies. It doesn't happen like that. <laughs> But the thing is, that's not, that's also not how God designed it to be. And yeah. it's amazing when you start looking into how God designed it to be and adjusting our expectations to match his, mm -hmm. how many things change there. So what have you learned about that part of marriage? Because even once you have a marriage, it's not easy. Yes, <laughs> It's not yeah. always easy to keep things going and to keep things healthy. So what have you learned about that? Yeah, we had some really good advice from someone who said, you know, when you get married, because people, you know, you're so in love when you're getting married and people would say, well-meaning like, oh, that's not going to last. You know, they say things like that, like, oh, soon you guys, after a few years, you guys are not going to be so goopy and all this, you know, and, and we kind of felt like, well, that is very negative. Like here we are so happy and you're telling us like, just wait, you're going to be unhappy. But we had one particular person who said, you know what, just keep the honeymoon going. Just try to keep that fire lit between you because it's a lot easier to just try to keep it alive than to 
to revive it if it dies. And I think the idea of that, of course, like I have a book books co-authored with Dr. Gary Chapman of the five love languages. And I love how Dr. Chapman says, you can't live in that euphoric state all the time or else you would not get anything done. <laughs> you know, so I get that. That makes sense. But that you continue to speak the, that, those love languages to your spouse. And I think what that friend was trying to tell us is you're not going to live in this giddiness your whole life, but why not live with that same appreciation love, commitment. And when you feel it dying down, do things like date nights, you know, which is kind of a theme of national marriage week, uh, do things like date night to keep those fires going. So that advice was very helpful to us to try to think that way. Like we can keep in this way, there'll be adjustments, but we got to keep on this plane because it's easier to stay on this plateau than to fall really far down. And usually for all couples, you don't just fall down in one swoop. It's like, a million, you know, times where you just, you know, spread one inch further away from each other. It's just, it's over time, what Jill Savage calls the slow fade. And so I think those are the things you have to guard against. Um, and, and we have certainly been there in the 24 years of marriage, um, three kids where it's like, wait a minute, the kids are getting way more attention than I'm getting, you know, what my husband's saying, or wait a minute, you know, I need more verbal affirmation. It's just hard being a stay home mom, you know, whatever it is. So those things happen. We were teaching a young marrieds class and we were laughing so hard because the, the couples were like sitting super close together. Like the boy, the guy would be like twirling the girl's hair and then he'd say something and she'd be like, oh, that was so funny, you know? And James and I were looking at them like, they're so like together. And then we were sitting literally a couple feet apart, you know, as the teachers and just like talking. And we were like, we are not affectionate like that with each other. So those moments give you that check of, okay, we are becoming too much like roommates. We are like business partners. We are like calendar keepers. We are friends. We're definitely friends. Like it's amiable, but okay. How can we, you know, so that is honestly like planning, like, okay, I am going to take your hand right now. Like we're at Costco and I'm going to grab your hand. You know, it's these little moments over and over and over that you're trying to reconnect, connect your spouse in a romantic way. Cause he's the only person you can act like that with. So we have found there are ebbs and flows, but you just got to keep going. You just got to keep at it. Oh, that's some solid advice. What I'm also hearing in, in what you're saying is kind of some hints at some red flags to watch out for and some things to have regular checks also, but ways to kind of check in with the health of your relationship and be mindful of that ongoing. So what are some of the red flags or just reminders that you could share that you've learned that can kind of help that relationship keep going? So I, this is, I'm so happy you asked this. I just recently did a webinar about this, that there are these things that we can fall into. And I think one red flag is contempt, that when you feel contempt for your spouse, and by that, I mean, you know, they come home, they tell you about your day and you think like, that's nothing. You should have seen what I had to do today. Like you kind of are like, yeah, whatever, buddy. And you have this contempt towards, you know, it used to be like, oh, you're so smart. And now we're kind of like, oh, what you say is so stupid, you know? <laughs> Like that we think on the insider attitude, like we are better than you. We know more than you. So if you feel like that is creeping into your heart, that you feel like you don't even appreciate me. Like I do all these things and you don't even say thank you anymore. I don't know what you do all day at work because I do this all day. You know, when you start feeling those kinds of feelings and thoughts, you wait a minute, this is contempt. And this is the opposite of what I should be feeling towards my spouse. You know, John Gottman has studied married couples for so many decades, and he can tell with 15 minutes of counseling, he can predict with 93% accuracy if the couple will make it over, over oh, time. Wow. And the way, one way he does it is contempt. Like if they have contempt towards each other, eye rolling, feeling, oh, whatever, you always do that. Like those kinds of things, those are red flags. So if you sense that is in your heart, that you're starting to do that, then it's like, okay, wait, that's a red flag. Another red flag flag is indifference, just apathy. Like, I really don't care. <laughs> like, should we go to marriage counseling? I don't care. Should we, you know, go on date night? I don't know. Do you want to go? Should we take this little staycation together overnight? I don't know. I'm not sure. Like, just, I really don't care. So that apathy, that indifference, that is a red flag of, okay, you need to kind of get in the game here. And, you know, I often think of my own children. So my kids are 18, uh, 16 and 13. And if they want to do something, I'm super into it. Like my daughter, youngest daughter is really into horses. I'm not even into horses. I like horses, but I've never, you know, been with a horse in my life before this, but she loves them. So every Saturday I'm excited. Let's go to the ranch and let's go 
ride horses. You know, she does it and I watch. And it's like, this is so exciting to me because I care about her. So a lot of times we transfer this interest and curiosity and excitement to our children. Like we don't care about soccer or martial arts or art or swim lessons, whatever, but because our kid is interested, we'll sit there for like two hours and, and wait for them or watch them or cheer them on or whatever it is. So what if, what about our spouse, right? Like if our spouse is like, oh, I'd like to do this. You're like, oh, that's so boring. I, I would totally never do that, right? So it is this reconnecting of, wait a minute, I should turn my indifference into being interested about this person again. So that's a red flag. If you're kind of like, I don't really care. I'm indifferent. I don't really find you that interesting anymore. And I don't really care if you like it. I don't, I don't really want to do it. So that'd be another red flag. Those are really good red flags. Even going back to the contempt one, um, scripture is so clear on warning us about yes. bitterness and resentment and unresolved anger, because there are so many spiritual implications as well, but that, that is like death to a marriage, yeah. but it's also like internally just in our own lives that yeah. can be so detrimental. Anytime we have that as a red flag, um, when we start sensing that bit of bitterness or resentment or anything that that's, that's dangerous ground to tread on for sure. Yeah, so that's really, really good advice, a really good red flag in a marriage, because when we see that, it's like, okay, that's when the communication needs to happen. And you, and you were you talking more that, about communicating yes. what you actually need and how important that is because your spouse does not think like you do and they're not designed to. That's a good thing. We don't want us all to be running around thinking the exact same thing all the time because it would be so boring. <laughs> so boring. <laughs> it would be so boring. <laughs> but when we're able to actually communicate and say, hey, I've noticed that this hasn't been happening. This is something that is important to me. Can we talk about how to make sure this happens? And what right. do you need? Yeah. Actually talking, having that kind of conversation. Yes. And and feel like, and say it just exactly like you just said it. Like there's no accusation there. There's no guilt there. It wasn't very long. Like, I feel like when you're talking to your husbands, they don't need like a 10 minute soliloquy about what you just said, right? <laughs> yeah. So it really will be so much more helpful if we can get in touch with, oh, this is what I need. Can you help me with this? And most good, decent spouses will say, yeah, I, I would like to help you with that. You said one phrase there that really jumped out at me too. You said, get in touch with. Sometimes it's a matter of stopping to check in with ourselves as well, because if we don't know what we want and what we need, how can our spouse know? <laughs> yeah. It's so important for us to recognize that. And so much of that can even come from spending that intimate time with Christ in, in prayer and just say, okay, God, what's lacking? Because I feel like there's something off. Can you help me understand this? And, and taking that into your prayer time and getting that clarity and discernment for yourself. So then you can communicate that to your spouse, because if you don't know, you can't expect that person to know. And that's something that's sometimes what we are guilty of doing, right? Yeah. I love that you said that because we can think, oh, let me talk to my friend about this, or let me scroll through social media and see if anyone else has the same issue. And then you're just spiraling out of control. Like you're looking at social media and you're thinking, oh, everyone else is complaining about this too. I, this must be valid. Instead of getting alone with God, getting alone with your thoughts, maybe writing in a journal, if that's some, a way you process things and just ask yourself, why am I so upset? Like, Holy Spirit, reveal to me what is wrong. Like, why am I so upset? And then wait for the Lord to tell you. And he might say something very clear to you. And then all of a sudden, it's this illumination of, oh, what I thought was the problem is not even the problem. So, yes, take that time because we're getting a lot of advice from the world and from kind of bad counsel, but we're not getting as much advice from the word of God, from spending time with God alone. It's free. And it's beautiful and life-changing. So spend that time with God to ask, what is going on with my marriage, Lord? You tell me. He is absolutely the best counselor ever. <laughs> so he is the counselor. And speaking like I'm I'm a therapist too, but speaking from this perspective, I would much rather somebody have that close connection with, yeah. with God. And having that as the core piece for a marriage is so powerful and so important because I think that that speaks to even the, the foundations of marriage itself and the purpose of marriage itself, because marriage is a God ordained thing. I mean, it's a union and it's something that should ideally reflect the relationship between Christ and the church. And that's no small thing. So it's, it makes perfect sense to me why we have such a spiritual warfare around the solidity of marriages and mm -hmm. how there has been so much attack on marriages and how there's so much damage that happens as a result of misunderstandings or lack of communication or bitterness and resentment kind of getting their roots in. There's so many yeah. ways that marriages can kind of fall apart 
but there's a reason for that because they're so important to point back to him. What have you learned about how powerful the the unified marriage can be? Oh, it's, it's like a, I just interviewed for my happy home podcast, Gary Thomas, and he talks about how marriage is a shelter. And that is a great, like in terms of your question, that's what marriage can be that when there is trouble, when you are just, maybe it's not trouble, but you're just got the blahs, you know, whatever it is that marriage, a unified marriage gives you a place of strength to operate out of. So you go out, you do your job and you duke the devil and you do all these things or whatever you do. And then you come home and your marriage is a safe place to be. If you have children, then it brings security to your kids to know mom and dad are in love. They're fine. And then from that secure place, then they can go discover like, what does God have for me? How can I minister to my friend? Um, how can I deal with this homework? You know, whatever it is. But, you know, my kids and I were having this conversation when kids don't have a secure marriage to, to grow in, you know, grow out of, then they are spending their time kind of dealing with the lack of that, kind of dealing with the fallout of that. So their energy is spent on the fallout of their parents' marriage or perhaps lack of marriage instead of perhaps going to that next level of, right, of learning themselves and learning what they like and, and moving on. So, so much of marriage, like a strong and happy marriage, not only gives a blessing to that couple, but it gives such a huge blessing to the children that follow after that. You know, and the Bible is full of from generation to generation to generation ancestors. It's all about that of passing on your faith to the next generation. So, you know, Na National Marriage Week is something from February 7th to 14th that celebrates marriage because the culture also needs to appreciate marriage. Like this is important because if people get married and love being married, then their kids will get married and love being married. And then they'll have kids who love being married and get married. And this is how a society perpetuates itself. I love what John Roseman, this um, psychologist talks about the empower, the importance of that fifth commandment of honor your father and mother that, you know, we know this is a very distinct commandment because it's the first one that offers a promise. The other ones didn't have a promise, but this one said, so it'll go well with you and you'll live long in the land. And he just talks about this is so important that kids learn how to honor because then they, that family replicates itself. If, if all the families in your nation honor the Lord, then you can imagine what kind of nation is this? What, what kind of, what does this look like? And so when that happens and families replicate themselves, it really has a huge impact on culture. But then of course, as families don't replicate that, you see, you know, the negative effect on culture too, of things kind of falling apart. So that strong marriage is really the beginning of, of that personal happiness for yourself, but also it ripples throughout your children and your culture. And it was super interesting. People are so interested in being happy now, right, Carrie? It's like, oh, well, it didn't make me happy. So I got out and like, we used to be happy, but we're not happy anymore. So we decided to separate like happiness is the supreme goal. But even research from social science, even if you didn't believe in God, didn't believe in the Bible, and you just wanted to be happy, Brad Wilcox and uh, Jeffrey Dew out of the National Marriage Project just came out with this research of, of, of happiness boosters. And they said, if you are just married, you get a 102% boost of your chance of being happy. And then if you're happily married, you get a 219% boost of your odds of being happy. And you can kind of compare this alongside of a 29% boost if you're a college graduate and a 51% boost if you have a higher income than most. So really like the social sciences are showing that people who are happily married are significantly happier than those around them. And, and so, you know, I, I, we hope that you're not in marriage for selfish gains, you know, in terms of like, I'm just here to be happy, but it really is a byproduct of, of living a good, solid marriage. You will be a much happier person. Okay. That's so good. I, I love hearing what marriage is capable of doing for us. And I also want to speak to anyone who's listening, who maybe is not married for whatever reason, whether yeah. marriage crumbled and fell apart and it feels like a hopeless situation, or you feel like you just, you're just not finding that person that God has not brought them into your life yet, or whatever it may be. I want to speak hope into that too, because ultimately our source of happiness, our source of joy, I'm going to say, I'm going to use joy instead of happiness. Our source of joy has to come from the Lord. And something that I have seen happen and play out in so many scenarios is that when we find that joy in the Lord first, then things start happening in other areas too. And learning that it's not the other person that is the source of that joy that comes with it, but it is going to the source. And then 
the marriage becomes a bonus. Then the marriage yeah. becomes a, like the extra, like the icing on the cake and, and all of that. Like, even if you're in a marriage and you're unhappy in that marriage, I mean, you've got some absolutely great tips and techniques and ideas and checking in and the communication. And I know that ultimately that's the goal and prayer is powerful. I want to make sure that's out there too, because God can restore and redeem. And I've seen it happen in beautiful, amazing ways, but I just want to encourage those who are listening, seek your joy from the one source of joy. Recognize that that other person does not complete you. The happy marriage is the bonus. <laughs> the happy marriage is the icing on the cake. And there's so much benefit that it does. Like, and you have given some, some great um, reasons why that's so important. And just the impact on culture, the impact on like the generations to come. That is, that's what God designed it to be. And I know we live in a messy fallen world and it doesn't always look like that. But being able to work at a marriage, being able to work at making it a happy, healthy union that is focused on Christ himself, how powerful that is. That is amazing. Just to think about how he designed it. And if we're seeking him for our next steps, if we're seeking him for discernment and wisdom and to be able to check in with ourselves and then communicate that with our spouse, how important that is, but also to recognize that that spouse, it's not their job to make us happy but we have a greater chance of being happy. Like you said, so I love it. I just, that distinction, it yeah. feels like a fine line sometimes, but it's so incredibly important because if you are in a place listening that you're not in that happy marriage and you don't have any prospects on the horizon that you see, that doesn't mean God doesn't have plans. It doesn't mean God doesn't have someone for your future, but it also means that you can seek that close relationship with him first. So you seek your joy in him first and then watch why he does, because it's amazing what he decides to do and how he sets things up, but there are so, there are so many times I feel like we have to check in with him first and say, okay, God, what, what do you want to do with me right now in this season? What do you want to do with me? So, so we can, so I can see what you have planned because his plans are always best. So I was wanted to at least give that hope too. And as we're kind of finding that balance there, because that can be a tough balance to have. Yeah. The Bible says in his presence, there's fullness of joy. His as in God. Yeah. So it's not the husband. It's not like in his presence, right. there's fullness of joy. So that fullness of joy is available for everyone, which is so awesome. And then, you know, it's funny that you say what you just did. So my husband literally wrote me a note this week because we were joking around like the whole you complete me thing. We we're like making jokes and stuff. And he wrote in the note, he said, you don't complete me but I am a better person because of you, you know, and oh, I like this, that. <laughs> and it's this thought of, you know, we are complete on our own with Christ. And obviously you compliment this person, you know, what he's trying to say, but it was very oh, yeah. funny. And it was, meant, it, it was met with a smile, you know, it was fun. I love that though. I mean, it's true though. It's like, it's, I had to get to a point in like, I mean, marriage is tough. And I had to get to a point too, where I realized, you know what, this is like the bonus. It's not, it's not the core. And like when yeah. we recognize that and have a healthy balance and how we even, yeah, um, yeah. look at our marriage, it sets such a different expectation because if we are expecting that other person to be all the things and to bring us joy and to, and to, to be the source of all that, that is too much pressure for any big burden. Be. That is a big burden. And it's like, you know, we don't want to do that to each other. And that's not what we're designed to do to each other. So I'm so grateful for that because that also means I'm not responsible for his happiness. <laughs> that's right. But I can sure do, do what I can to try to bless him and try to be a blessing to him and find ways to support and encourage. And like you're talking about, like finding ways to date and just be creative. So I want to spend a few minutes just asking you for some ideas, because this is the fun part, just some ideas to just keep things fresh and new. If you have any creative ideas to try yeah. to introduce and start something new, especially with marriage week and all, if you have any ideas to share. Yeah. And you know what? You can ask your friends too. just be like, what was the greatest date you've ever been on with your spouse? You know, if you ask that to your friends and look at all the amazing dates you would get, but a couple that come to mind that are very easy. So I'll give you easy ones, right? So like a remember one date. So if you live in a city that you used to live in, maybe, maybe if you have like old apartment, you could visit or a restaurant that you used to go to all the time or a particular park you went to when you were dating, like something that has something to do with your past, but you haven't gone there for a while. Maybe you went bowling like a super long time ago and you want to do that again. So kind of like a remember when date. And especially like if you have, like I live in San Diego and we live in a house now because we have children, but we used to live in a little, you know, two bedroom condo. And so that would be a fun date for us to drive up to the condo, you know, park in the parking lot and kind of do like a remember when before we had kids and then go eat somewhere close to that. So just like a remember when date. Um, another one is you go to a bookstore. So find a 
physical bookstore if you have one near you and give them business. That would be good. So go into the bookstore, you pick a, and like you have a title you want your spouse to read and vice versa. So you basically hand your spouse something you're interested in that you would like them to know about. It could be a marriage book. It could be fiction. It could be a business book. It could be a spiritual book, anything. So something you're interested in and you guys trade books and then you sit there, you read for a few minutes and hopefully if the spouse likes it enough that they will agree then to read it and you will too. And maybe you're like, I hate this book. Go get me another book. <laughs> for me to read. And that would be fine too. So the idea here is sometimes we get like bored with each other, but one thing that's so beautiful about books is then you have these new ideas and these new revelations and these new thoughts, and you can talk about them together. So do a book date. Another date, it would be like an active date. Like what can you do together? Whether it's a walk in the park, whether it's okay, we're going to grab our bikes, whether it's, we're going to learn how to row. My husband and I learned how to row. It was hilarious. We took lessons, the whole thing. So you know, do something like that, you, you know, so do something active, something that will get you out in nature, something that either you both enjoy or one of you enjoys and one of you tolerates or something <laughs> that you want to learn together. Like once we took a square dancing, you know, lesson, like do something kind of active. That's super fun. Um, another thing just that you could do at home is like a candlelight dinner with your kids. So for instance, if you have a lot of kids and you're like, it's so expensive to pay for babysitting and or how are we going to do this? I know one mom who she would make movie night kind of special. So that's another piece. Um, you know, I have technology books like Screen Kids to, to make it so that movie night would be special, you know, so it was special to the kids. Like we're going to pop popcorn. We're going to, you're going to watch this movie. It's going to be great. So the kids would watch the movie and then the mom and dad would go in the other room. They dress up. They'd put a white tablecloth on, they'd light candles and they'd have a dinner together. And I think that's so beautiful because it's physically showing in the midst of this busyness of parenthood, we still like court each other. And then for the kids, I think that's super cool, even if they interrupt and they're all pesky and whatever, but they saw like, look what my mom and dad did. Like what a cool memory to give them. So those are a couple ideas, but I really rediscovered how important date night was through National Marriage Week because- They've done all this research on date night, Jeffrey Dew um, and um, Brad Wilcox out of the National Marriage Project. And they they surveyed people like, do you date? And 52% of married couples said, no, we never date or we only date a few times a year. And then 48% of, mar of married couples said, yes, we do date at least once a month or more. And what they found was the cohort that dated they showed significant gains, like a 15% gain in areas like feeling of commitment towards each other, not likely to divorce, physically satisfied with each other, happy with the communication, overall happiness. They showed a 15% boost just because they dated once a month or more. And you can kind of see that. Like if you date, then you're talking to each other, you're more connected, you've established your priority to one another. So for me, for my husband and I, we were, we're basically, we both work from home. So we see each other a lot. We have dinner every night together. Many days we have lunch together. So it's like, okay, we see each other a lot. Like why in the world do we need to date? So we kind of are, you know, you're once a month kind of barely getting it in there daters, but you know, once a month, but after seeing this research, we're like, whoa. So we literally have changed and thought, okay, we're going to do two coffee dates a month. And then we'll do like one kind of date date. And so that gives us three touch points a month. And, you know, the coffee date is very simple. It's just like literally it could be five minutes from our house or we could go half an hour depending on how much time we had, but it could be very simple. And so we have found just in doing that, that it's like, oh, it does boost. You get excited about it. Like you get the anticipation of doing something novel, the anticipation of like having focused attention with this person. It really is helpful. So I am a big fan that that's something very simple you can do to boost your marriage. And I'm so grateful for the research of National Marriage Week and the National Marriage Project to bring this to bear. I really appreciate you sharing that with us too. Those are good tips and really good date ideas. And I'm jotting them down just so you know. <laughs> That's right. I can schedule something always, with my husband. Always re-listen. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so yes, I love that so much. I want to ask you if you could share 
where someone can find more information about what you're doing and about National Marriage Week and yep. all the things you're you're talking about. Yes. Yeah, so marriageweek.org, marriageweek.org will give you resources about National Marriage Week. There's a wonderful thing called a couples connection plan. So that's what I would point you towards. If you get the couples connection plan, it will give you like all sorts of ideas to refresh your marriage, like things to talk about with your spouse, ways to set goals with your spouse, how to speak the five love languages to your spouse. So that's really good. And then there's also a national mar marriage calendar where you could look for marriage events, like in your area to attend, you know, going to a marriage workshop, going to a date night, like all those things could be really helpful. If your church is sponsoring an event and you want to post it on that national calendar, you could do that. If you wanted to like travel to Alaska for a vacation, you could see, is there a marriage event happening in Alaska? So there's lots of ways you can use that national calendar, but I would point you there. And then my books about marriage are 31 days to a happy husband and 31 days to becoming a happy wife. I also write about technology because technology can be very distracting in a, in a marriage. Uh, so I, one of my books is calm, cool, and connected five digital habits for a more balanced life. So you're staring at your spouse, at least a fraction of the time that you're staring at your phone. And those books can be found on my website, arlenepelican.com. Just my name, arlenepelican.com. Okay. I will share a link to that in the show description too. I so appreciate you coming and just sharing your thoughts and, and your wisdom on a happy, healthy marriage. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you once again for tuning in to the Everyday Royalty Podcast. I'm so honored to have you as a listener and just wanted to extend the opportunity to share your testimony. As you may know, we value testimonies highly on this podcast and we focus a lot on the power of those testimonies and just how important it is to share what God is doing and has done in your own story. If you are interested in sharing your story of how God has impacted your life and what he has done for you, then go to testimonies.everydayincredible.net to learn how to share yours. Always remember who and whose you are. Have a blessed day.